One of the things I love about this church is that people are honest with their questions. Uh, so two weeks ago, the number one question people asked about God, the faith, faith and Bible, we had like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions asked. Most asked question, are there unforgivable sins? Is suicide an unforgivable sin? We talked about that two weeks ago. Who was here for that? Okay, so then last week we talked about can I be gay and be Christian? We had that whole conversation. That was a really interesting conversation. I, I enjoyed that. And then today, the third biggest question people asked was basically, I don't even know if I believe. So I'm here, come to church. Uh, I'm not really sure I believe. Or we asked, had people ask the same questions out in the community. They said, what's your favorite, or what's the biggest question you have about God, the Bible, or faith? People are like, I don't really know if I believe. And, like, and so like, I got some questions. I got questions like, is the Bible corrupt? Has it been twisted? Is somebody, some little gremlin coming along and, <laughs> and just add stuff to it? I had too much caffeine. <laughs> like, is there, is there something in the Bible that's just like not true? Do they take stuff out? Do they add stuff in? And by the way, where did that whole book come from? So many people ask these questions. And I, here's the, this, is, this, is, this is so fun to me because this to me is the easiest question in the world to answer. Um, so uh, like if you're, if you're like, I think the Bible got corrupted. And like, like, I'm so glad you're here because we get to have so much fun with this question. I have a, a degree in history. I have a master's degree in biblical studies. I can answer these kind of questions. This doesn't stress me out. I'm stoked about it. So I'm say, buckle up. Look at the person next to you and say, pay attention. Because we're going to help you get some of these questions answered today about where the Bible, I remember being a kid. I remember being like, I'm like 10 and my parents would take me to church and like I'm laying in bed at night and like I, I have this image in my brain and like I'm not, I don't even know if you're supposed to even think this and like it's the Bible and it's like, oh, it's like floating down from the sky. God just dropped it in. Oh, and I just kind of like helicoptered it in. And there was a person who like grabbed it and was like, oh, it's the Bible. Oh, this is awesome. We should all read this. It's the truth. <laughs> when you were a kid or maybe even now, do you ever wonder where that thing showed up from? Who's ever wondered that question? Can I be honest? Come on, that's, that's a pretty typical question. It's not a bad question, but there are answers to these questions. And so we're gonna talk about today where the Bible came from and how do we know it's been corrupted or hasn't been corrupted. We're gonna pray and we're gonna do it. Are we ready to go? Okay, Jesus, thank you for what you're about ready to do. Thank you for giving us the word of God. Help us understand where it came from, what it's all about. God, uh, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. Uh, but I do know uh, that I can give some good information and some good background from a scholarly perspective on the scriptures. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Help me enjoy this academic subject. Help the person next to me not to fall asleep. Help those online to stay with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're gonna have a conversation about the Bible. Check, check out. We have to start out by what is the Bible? Like what, is, what actually is the Bible? Because the reason why people get into discussions about the Bible, well, I think this about the Bible, and I think this about the Bible, people don't even know what the Bible is, therefore they get in all kinds of discussions. And so I'm gonna give you three thoughts on what the Bible is before we start answering your questions about corruption. First thing I want you to know about the Bible is this. It's not a book, it's a library. The Bible is a library, come on, say library. Bible is a library, not a book. In fact, if you were to go read the Bible and you were just like, okay, it's like any other book, I'm just gonna start at the beginning. And so you kind of like in the beginning and then you start going through. And by the time you get to chapter five and so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so, you're like, what the heck is this? And then a little bit later, you're like, that guy killed that guy with a rock and then this thing happened over here. And then, whoa, like that's, that was weird. And like, you start reading through, you're like, I don't get it. Like, and immediately you're like, I'm done. <laughs> Because it's not like any other book. The, books, the Bible is not meant to be read from beginning to end. The Bible is a library. When you go to a library, what do you do? You scope out something that's interesting to you and then you read about that. Like that's how the Bible is to work. Like you're supposed to find like, okay, what topic would you like to study? And so like, well, I don't even know where to look for those verses. Well, that, that's because you, but guess what? You have Google. <laughs> Google's awesome. You can type any subject in and say, what does the Bible say about what? And it will tell you. It will give you all the verses about that subject. The Bible is, read to be, is meant to be read like a library. Come on, say library. And just like any library, the libra a library is full of tons of different authors. So is, the, so is the Bible. Let me just give you some background on the scriptures so you get where the scriptures came from. 40 different authors. 40 different people wrote that book. Different economic backgrounds. Some were extremely poor. Some were insanely rich. Uh, one guy's as rich as Bill Gates. Um, different jobs. Some were politicians. Some were homeless some were warriors, some were pastors, some were fishermen, some were poets, some were doctors. They, were, they wrote the Bible on three different continents. Part of it was written on, on Africa. Part of it was written in the Middle East. Part of it is written in or, or, or Asia. Part of it's written in Europe. 
The Bible's written on three different continents. What's really weird, it was written over a almost 2,000 year period. First book is actually Job. It's written in 2800 BC at the same time period when they're building the pyramids. Moses writes Genesis in about 1446 BC. John finishes up Revelation and John in about 90 AD. So it's about a 2,000 year period to write this book. On three different continents, all kinds of different backgrounds. Think about how different the cultures would be. I mean, think about how different our culture is versus Japan. That's different. Or our culture versus South America, or our culture versus Africa. The cultures are so different, yet the Bible, from all these different cultures and all these different backgrounds, and this just took us even further. Some of these guys wrote poetry, because they were poets. So that's what they wanted to write, but I wrote some poetry. Some people wrote history, because they were historians. Some wrote civil and religious, or uh, criminal law, because they were lawyers, sorry. Um, <laughs> some wrote on ethics, some wrote stories and parables, some wrote biographies, some wrote prophecy, some wrote some sermons, and some people just wrote some letters to some friends. And all of it, all of this different mismatch of cultures, different ideas over thousands of years all end up in one book. Now think about the average library. Think about how much the authors disagree, how much they counteract each other, how much if you were to put it all in one book, it'd make no sense. But for some weird reason, when you take the Bible over all those thousands of years and all those different backgrounds and all those different cultures, somehow they still, the writers, they still complement each other. It's almost like there's some sort of divine editor in the background matching up these cultures and these perspectives and these thought processes over thousands of years to give you the book that you have in front of you. You get something that's different than any other book in all of world history. This is the library that actually complements every author versus contradicts. Let me take it a little further. I'm gonna be a preacher just for a minute and then we'll start answering some of those, those questions about corruption. If somebody says to me, uh, well, is the Bible from God or from man? Here's how I always answer that question. The Bible contains a, both a human and a divine element. Human and divine element, the way I would say it is this, God moved in the hearts of men to write down his words. Now, what I want to say is this, God did not dictate the Bible. He wasn't like sitting there in a lounge chair and he was like, Moses, write down this, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. Moses was like, okay, in the beginning, but that's not how it worked. Like, like, literally, this is how the Bible says the Bible was written. This is the Bible describing how this book came to be. This is Second Peter. He says this, Above all, Peter says, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came along by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were what? As they were what? As they were what? Carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, what he basically is saying is this, that Men wrote some stuff down as the Spirit of God directed them, which means they put their own ideas into it, their own thought processes into it, but it still went exactly where God wanted it to go. Uh, the, the word for carried along in the scriptures, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Greek Bible, is the word pharaomenoi, which I'm not gonna make you say, but it's the Greek word for carried along. And it's where we get the concept of a wind-driven ship. I mean, think about a ship for a second. You got a, a rudder in the back, and you got a pilot grabbing hold of the rudder, and then you got wind in the sail, and combined, the wind in the sail and the pilot on the rudder, those combination of events cause a ship to move to a destination. Would you agree with that? In the same way, that's how the scriptures were written. There is a wind of the Spirit of God blowing into the sails, and there is this pilot who's kind of guiding the ship, and they get exactly where the Spirit of God wants that ship to go, but they use their own words, their own ideas, their own thought process. So for example, um, in the book of Titus, at one point, Paul, the apostle Paul, quotes a Greek poet. In fact, the, the quote is actually, all, all Titans, or uh, all, all Cretans are evil brutes. And he's just like making a joke there for a second, but it ends up in the Bible. Like why? Because he's using his own language and his own thought processes, at the same time, still guilt going in the direction of where he wants the scriptures to go. God still gets it where he wants it to go. So you have both a human and a divine element. So we say, is it from God? Yes. Did it come from man? Yes. But together you get the best book ever on wisdom for your life. Does that make sense? Now, having said all that, 
the point of the scriptures, and I'm gonna be done being a preacher in a minute, and we'll talk about some of the questions you have. Um, the point of the scriptures is to reveal Jesus. The point of the scriptures is to reveal who? It's to reveal Jesus. So like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the beginning of the Bible is still to reveal Jesus. Well, Jesus didn't show up for 1, 1,500 years later. How is it about Jesus? Every book is about Christ. And every time, this, this is why this matters, every time you get confused, and like, well, I was reading about this thing, and this happened here, and this was weird, and I didn't really understand. Every time you get confused on it, just be like, whoa, didn't get that. I'm gonna go back to reading Jesus. Why? Because the more you get Jesus, the more he will explain the rest to you. The more you understand Christ, the more you understand what he came to be and what he came to do, the more you get Christ, the more you understand the word of God. How do I know? Because Jesus was the word, the scriptures say. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus Christ is the word. The more you understand Jesus, the more you're going to get, well, why'd that guy hit that guy with a rock? And what about that thing over there that I didn't get? Like, if you, if you get confused, just go back to reading about Jesus. Jesus. Now, this is so simple. Some of you are like, but the Bible isn't really about Jesus. Yes, it really is. From the very beginning of the Bible, it's about Christ. I can prove it to you. Genesis chapter three is the story of Adam and Eve. They eat the fruit. Uh, they end up like, getting punished by God. They have this whole conversation. And God says to them in the moment, after they eat the fruit, he says, eventually your son will get struck in his heel by the snake. And the son will mm, crush the head of the snake. That's Genesis chapter three. It's the very beginning of the Bible. That's 1400 BC it's written. And who's it about? Jesus. The snake strikes him. And Christ crushes the head of the snake when he rises from the dead. See, every book is just about who? Jesus. So when you get confused, go back to reading. Just go back to reading Jesus. The more you know Jesus, the more you can get that other stuff figured out. Now that's my preacher hat, taking my preacher hat off. Let's put my scholar hat on for a second. So how, how like, like, like how do we know it hasn't been, go ahead and go put the next slide up. The next one, we're past that already. How do we, how do we know the Bible hasn't been corrupted? How do we know? Well, I was watching the History Channel this one time. Yeah, they also have ancient aliens on that, on that channel. And if you believe that, I would love to sell you some stuff. <laughs> For real, man, I could make a fortune. <laughs> like everybody gets ancient aliens is dumb. That is dumb as in, like that's dumb. Like in the same way, like I want you to understand when the, the History Channel puts that crap on there, like they're trying to create controversy so you'll watch in the same way you watch ancient aliens because there's nothing else to watch. Like I'm bored <laughs> and you watch that. Like, like, like the History Channel, I'm gonna talk about it in a minute but it's trying to create controversy where there is no controversy. How, how, do you, how do you know the Bible hasn't been corrupted? What about the gremlins that came in that changed it all and what we have now is really jacked up and wrong? Oh, this is so fun. Let's talk about the copying process for just a second. Let's just talk about the fact that this book has been copied different than any other book in the history of the world so that we can actually compare to make sure it's never been corrupted. So let me give you some, uh, some examples. Like this is how, by the way, this is an image of a guy in Israel, this was last year we took this picture. He is copying the scriptures like they have copied them for 3,000 years. It's still copied the same way. Uh, you can find copies that look just like that, by the way, from 50 BC that are identical, called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they still make the same exact copying Plans. Let me just give you a couple ideas. Um, so this is, this is uh, anybody ever heard of a scribe before? Put your hand up, you know what a scribe is. A scribe is, uh, before we had printing presses, before we had copy machines, to copy something, you had to do it by hand. That's called a scribe. Here's how a scribe would copy scripture. This has been going on for 3,000 years. Uh, a scribe was required to ignore anyone who spoke to him while he was copying so he would not make a mistake. Even if the king addressed him, he could flip off the king and ignore the king. Like, in other ways, you ignore the king, they can kill you. In this place, in this case, nope, the scriptures are so important, I can ignore the king. Why? Because I don't want to like, get sidetracked and come back and forget where I was. Uh, that picture, by the way, we were trying to get his attention while he was copying the scriptures, he totally blew us off. <laughs> All scribes were required to copy letter by letter, not word by word or phrase by phrase. So they couldn't go, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1-1. They had to go, I, I, N, N. B, letter by letter, so they wouldn't make a mistake. Uh, all scribes 
Uh, this next one is interesting to me too. Between every letter, the space of a hair must intervene. So just to make sure they didn't smudge the letters and like end up with the wrong word, they put, they do the letter and they put a hair, then they could do the next letter. Then they do a hair, then they do the next letter. I'm, I'm not kidding you. We'll keep going. A scribe called the counter had the middle letter of every line memorized and checked each manuscript for additions and subtractions. So there was one guy who was a counter. He knew the middle letter of every line was N-R-F-T-Z-E-L. He'd look at the manuscript and go, is it that exact combination of letters? If it's not, it's wrong, we're killing it. We're burning it. That was his whole job. All he did was memorize letters. Make sure they were the same. In fact, I skipped one on here already and I wanna come back to it. Uh, Every scribe, in order to copy a book, was required to have it memorized before they could copy a single letter. Hard to make a mistake if it's already been memorized. Word for word, letter by letter. A scribe could only make three mistakes per book or the book was burned so they wouldn't get confused with other books. So here's what they would do. Imagine for a second, you're, the, you're a scribe and you're writing the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is 66 chapters long. It's the longest book in the Old Testament. You have made three mistakes. If you make one more, the book is gonna get burned. You're on the last chapter. You're on Isaiah 66, verse four. You're almost done with this book. You're so stoked, you finally complete it and you make a dumb error. No book for you. Take it out, torch it, start over. You're a sucky scribe. But that's how they made sure the scriptures didn't get corrupted. A scribe could only make three mistakes. Uh, When a copy was worn out or deteriorated, it was buried so it would not get used or confused with the ones they were using today. So this is why we dig them up all over the world. When they started to fall, fall apart and like words started to miss and they started to like, like get all deteriorated, they'd be like, whoa, we can't use this anymore, but it's the scriptures, we can't burn it. So they would just take it out and bury it someplace. And we've been digging this stuff up all over the planet for the past several hundred years. This is what's really fascinating about this. Scholars today say that the Hebrews were so careful with the scriptures in copying that there is a 99.9% accuracy rate after 3,000 years of copying. There is no other book like this in the world, guys, none. There's no book that even comes close to this. Now, some of you are like, yeah, 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 I know there's corrupt. Well, we'll just compare it to the rest of ancient literature. Let's just compare it to, like, I'm a nerd out. Let's compare it to all of ancient literature for a second. Like, like Plato wrote some books. Aristotle wrote some books. Uh, Julius Caesar wrote some books. Let's just talk about these for a second. Let's talk, we'll just do Plato and, and, and uh, Julius Caesar. We'll just use those two. We'll use uh, Plato and Julius Caesar. There are 210 copies of Plato anywhere in the world that were handwritten, 210, that's it. There's 251 copies of Julius Caesar anywhere on planet Earth. All of the copies that we have, all of them, are a thousand years after these people lived. These handwritten copies, a thousand years after they lived and many of the copies don't agree with each other so we don't even really know what he really meant. Because the copies we do have, they're like, well, I don't, like you said this in one and this one in another one, which, which one is right? Well, it's a thousand years after he lived, we don't know. Maybe he didn't write any of it. Maybe some guy wrote it and said it was Julius. We really don't know. Huh, we'll even go further. Like this, is, this is 210 sheets of paper. So I have 210 sheets of paper up here. Let's just pretend this is Plato's, the copies of Plato we have anywhere in the world. By the way, just for fun, I'll throw this out there. I didn't say this any of the services. If you go back 10 or 15 years ago, we only had 10 copies. We found 200 more copies in the last, in the last 10 years that we've been digging up. That's how good archaeology has been in the last 10 years. Anyway, we've got 210 today. Every time we dig up one of these, we compare them with all the rest and they don't agree. But nobody, nobody says, Plato didn't write that. Everybody goes, nope, written by Plato. Well, how do we know? It was a thousand years after he lived that we have a copy and the copies don't agree. What did he really say? Maybe he didn't say it, write any of it. We don't really know. But there's, the historians don't go, nope, didn't write it. We all go, that was written by Plato. Huh, now let's compare this to the Bible. And by the way, that's not a, this is pretty much any ancient literature book you, you can throw out there, that's the truth. Now let's compare it to the Bible. Hold on, I'll be right back. This will be fun. As of this year, we have about approximately 5,000 500 copies of the ancient scriptures. (laughs) 
5,500 handwritten copies. Some of our copies, remember these copies, they are thousand years like away from the authors. Some of these copies date within 30 years of the author. 30 years. In fact, let me give you a picture of the book of John. This is one little scrap of the book of John. This is uh, something we dug up. This is, this is John from 120 AD. He wrote it in 90. This is one little parchment of that scroll of the book of John. We're within 30 years of John writing it down. Now let's even take it further, okay? All 5,500 handwritten copies, check this out, all, come on, say all, basically agree. 5,500 copies, and oh, I'm throwing this out, this would be fun, just, just for those of you that want to nerd out a little bit. Um, we also have um, 35,000, I didn't want to make that much paper, um, 35,000 sermons from the early church fathers, the disciples of the disciples, and they're quoting the Bible all the time, and all those quotes agree with all of this. Now, here's what's even trippier about this. All of these copies were dug up on different continents. They were dug up in Europe. They were dug up in Africa. They were dug up in the Middle East. They're dug up all over the planet. And every time we dig up a copy, they still basically all say the exact same thing. Huh. The odds of this occurring by chance, by the way, are 750 billion to one. See, there is no other book like this in the world. This book is unique in all of ancient literature, that when you look at the copies we have, they all basically agree, and we have thousands and thousands of them, so people are like, I wonder if it's corrupt. You can check them all. What does this one say versus that one? And we basically, that way, what you have in front of you right now is basically the same thing they have had since right after the time of Christ. Oh, 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 but I was watching the History Channel and they left some books out. (laughs) Who's ever heard this before? Insert eye roll here. Um, Yes, some books were left out. They left out the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, and the Gospel of Adam and Eve. Now, let me just talk about these. These are some of the books they left out. This is like the the major ones. Um, They left out Judas because the book of Judas says Jesus wasn't a bad guy, he was a good guy. They were like, well, that doesn't match up with anything else I've read. Um, The Gospel of Adam and Eve, (laughs) think about that for a second. How are they going to know it's from Adam and Eve? (laughs) Uh, The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary. Let me just talk about these books for a second because this is just so inane that people think this was supposed to be in the Bible. Let me just give you a couple of thoughts underneath this. Uh, None of these left out books, none of them, come on, say none, were written by who they were claimed to be written by. None of them. The Gospel of Mary was not written, written by Mary. It was written 200 years after Mary by some guy who was like, hey, I think I wanna write a book and call it the Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of Thomas, written 200 years after Thomas. The Gospel of Judas, 200 years after Judas. The Gospel of Adam and Eve, <laughs> really long time after Adam and Eve. None of the books are written by who they're claimed to be written by. All scholars agree with that. All scholars agree with that. Secondarily, the books are written hundreds of years after Jesus. I already just told you a second ago, we have the Gospel of John to within 30 years. And I'm gonna jump to this bottom thing on the bottom and then we'll come back to the second thing. It's like me writing a book on George Washington right now, a couple hundred years after George, and claiming it's more true than the books that were written by his friends. Would that be stupid? If you believe me, you should also watch Ancient Aliens. (laughs) Like, I can't tell you more about George than George's friends could have told you about George. For me to be like, ha, ah, I have new truth about George Washington a couple hundred years after George. You should roll your eyes and tell me to shut up. By the way, let's even be fun, more fun with this. Um, we only have a very few copies of any of these books and none, none of them agree. But the History Channel wants you to, what? 
watch, they like are trying to get viewership. So they never tell you that the books were written hundreds of years later. They never tell you that the writers aren't the real writers. They just say, what about this? And people are naive enough to believe it. And every scholar would tell you these books are not from the same time period as the Gospels. They're just way later by random other people. Now, why were there other books? Well, just think about this for a second. Why are there other books now? Because people like to write stuff. I know, it's crazy. People write things down. It's like, the, oh, there's other books. Yeah, are there other books now? Duh. Okay. Um, it's, I just literally, I, I don't even understand the question. Like, it's so, like, what? Um, <laughs> that's why I, I love to pop people's bubbles because it's so easy to fix this corruption thing. Um, the books, the, 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 these books, um, the Gnostic Gospels, they came, contain ridiculous stories the church knew were fictitious and contradicted the morality of scriptures. For example, Judas was a good guy, not a bad guy. That contradicts everything from 200 years earlier. That's not true. That was pretty easy to be like, nope. Um, let's go further. Um, these books like tell all kinds of stories about Jesus in childhood. Why? Well, because at the time, two or 300 years after Christianity became popular, the only other major religion was the Greek religion. Think about the Greek religion or the Roman religion at the time. You have Greek, you have Greek gods. You have like Hercules and Hera and Zeus. And Zeus is throwing these lightning bolts. And he's awesome. But it's kind of like the Avengers. And you've got, you've got Hercules who's like super strong. And like, you've got all these superheroes. And then what do you, like I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus. Well, what did he do? He died. Well, that's not as cool as the Greek gods. And the Christians were like, well, our God's kind of boring. <laughs> like, well, he rose from the dead, I know, but like well, the other gods get to do cool stuff. So they started to create fictitious stories about Christ's childhood. These are the Gnostic Gospels. So for example, let me just give you some of the stories in the in Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, these are fun. Um, so um, this is just one of the stories. Like Jesus was walking to school and his buddy's walking with him and his buddy tripped and bumped into him and caused Jesus to trip. Therefore, his buddy fell down and died because he tripped the son of God. That's ridiculous. Another story, so Jesus is in class. He's a little kid and he's in class and everybody gets this little lump of clay to make things. And so they all start making like clay bunnies and clay birds and Jesus' clay bird flew away. That's ridiculous. Um, there's another story in there where Jesus corrects the teacher. He's like, no, you're wrong, it's really this. So the teacher takes a ruler and tries to strike Jesus and the teacher's arm falls off. Because he almost struck the son of God. That's ridiculous. One of my favorites is like Mary changes Jesus' diaper and so she's like running it out to the, to the wherever and she's like taking it out and she bumps into a leprous man and the leprosy gets cured instantly. That's some holy... Right? And the church went, that's ridiculous. And my, my very favorite, I just throw this out there, this is for fun. So like Jesus and another buddy are playing on the roof, I'm the, on the roof of this house, and they're playing on the roof, and his buddy falls off the roof and dies. So he's like laying there dead, and the whole town comes running over, and they're like, they see the dead kid, and they see Jesus on the roof, and they're like, oh, you pushed him off the roof. And he goes, I didn't push him. You did too, you pushed him. Ask the dead kid. And the dead kid lays there and goes, he didn't push me. That's the story. He doesn't resurrect the dead kid. He just makes the dead kid defend him and stay dead. That's ridiculous. <laughs> these are why these stories are not in the scriptures. Anybody could read them and go, that's just goofy. And they're hundreds of years after Christ. So when you hear about other books, you have nothing to worry about. That stuff is whack. Um, now, so far, I've given you some info, but like I haven't really convinced anybody. So like this is, I'm gonna kind of turn around. Why should we trust the Bible is actually from God then? Like I'm gonna turn the corner here. So why should we trust the Bible really is from God? Like how do I know it really is from God? And I'm gonna give you a couple different reasons as to why I believe it's from God. You can do with it what you want. All I'm trying to do is to get to go from a little bit less skeptical to a little bit more open-minded. Um, number one, because of the accuracy of scripture. Because of the accuracy, come on say accuracy. Let's talk about history for a second. This is awesome. Uh, the Bible is supported by archaeology. It's not proven wrong by archaeology. In fact, I'm going to give you this quote by uh, Nelson Gluck. Um, Nelson Gluck is an archaeologist. He says this, It may be categorically stated that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. In other words, this. 
Even archaeologists today that don't believe in Jesus still use the Bible to find the sites they're digging up. Because the Bible says there are mountain ranges and there are valleys and there are cities here and there should be coinage over there and this happened over here in this battlefield and they can go find it. Where the Bible says something exists, they can go find it. Now, people are like, no, that doesn't really work. So for hundreds of years, people mocked the Bible, 17 and 1800s, because of this group called the Hittites. Come on, say Hittites. They had never discovered the Hittites. They don't exist. Like the Bible talks about them all over the place, but they're not really legit and they're not really real until 1906. Archaeologist in 1906, using the coordinates the scriptures give on where the Hittites should have been found, uncovered the Hittite capital city and 40 other Hittite cities exactly where the Bible said they would be. Oh, Bible wins again. Oh, oh, but there's so many more. But by the way, I could spend all day. We could do seven hours just on archaeology proving the Bible to be true. I could do all day long. You want to do it? No, you don't. <laughs> I'd like to go fishing this afternoon. <laughs> uh, so I'll, but I'll give you a few. I'll give you a few. Uh, the second one is Belshazzar. He was a king of Babylon. And for centuries, people were like, like, the Bible's false because Belshazzar doesn't exist. Daniel writes about him, but he's not a real guy. We don't have any evidence he really existed. And then, just so you know, um, in 1956, archaeologists discovered this stone cylinder. It's called the Cylinder of Nabonidus. And guess who the whole thing is about? Belshazzar. Belshazzar in Babylon, what he did, where he went, this is his story written on a cylinder, exactly as the Bible describes it. Let me, let me go further. Um, this one's fun. Um, there's, a, there's a king of Assyria called Sennacherib. Uh, everybody say Sennacherib. Sennacherib. Um, and we know he's a real guy because archaeologists had dug him up, but the Bible talks about him, and the Bible talks about him in goofy ways. Like, goofy ways. Like, this is one of the stories about Sennacherib in the Bible. I'm like, this can't possibly be true. The Bible has got to be wrong on this. This is 2 Kings chapter 19, 35 and 36. That night, the angel of the Lord went out to put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. So an angel comes through and wipes out an entire army of 185,000. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, as I told you about him, the king of Assyria broke camp and withdrew and he returned to Nineveh and he stayed there. That sounds ridiculous. Now, this, let me give you this story so you get the context. The passage is, is this. This guy named Sennacherib gets an army of 185,000. He marches on Israel, kicks everybody's butt, finally surrounds Jerusalem. Jerusalem is quaking. They're like freaking out. We're all gonna die. They pray to God, God, please help us. There's 185,000 people who come to kill us. They wake up the next morning. The entire army is wiped out and Sennacherib's standing there by himself. I gotta go. <laughs> That's the story in the Bible. And it seems really ridiculous. <laughs> until they found the Taylor prism. This is the Taylor prism. This is dug up in the last century. It is Sennacherib's own words about the peoples he conquered. And here's what he says about this battle. He says, I conquered all of Israel and I trapped the king of Israel, Hezekiah, like a caged bird in Jerusalem. And then I went home. <laughs> <laughs> It's the same story. He just doesn't want to say, and my entire army was dead and I felt like a dork. <laughs> See, when you look in the scriptures, by the, well, I'll throw one out. I didn't say this to any of the services. So I'm just going to throw this in, the, in this one. Even a simple thing. Like people are like, uh, the star in the sky for, for, for Jesus being born. Yeah, the Chinese in 3 or 4 BC record a comet flying across the sky for 70 days at the same time period when Christ would have been born. It's in Chinese archaeology. You can go thing after thing. After, I could just do this, do this. We could do this all day, man. Now let's compare this. We'll have, we'll have fun. Let's, I told you this book is different than any, any other book. I'm not trying to rip on other books. I just want to give you a comparison. So I'm going to compare two other religious books. We're going to compare the Book of Mormon and the Quran. Let's start with the Book of Mormon. Uh, no other, not one, not one. Come on, say not one. Shred of evidence has ever been uncovered for any of it. Not one thing in the entire Book of Mormon. So, just so you get, if I had the Book of Mormon here right now, right, right now, the Book of Mormon is the story of how the Hebrews went from where they were to North America in 400 AD. And they landed on the shores of North America. They were here from 400 AD to 600 AD, and Jesus hung out with them. And they built cities, 
And there were rivers and mountains and great cities and like, like there was coinage and like the Book of Mormon describes all the stuff that happens in North America and they can't find any archeological evidence for any of it. Not one mountain range, not one river, not one lake, not one coin, not one city, none of it. Huh, that might make you wanna pause for a second. Oh, but the Bible, we have plenty of evidence. Book of Mormon, eh, it strikes out. Now, we can take it a little further. We can talk about the Quran for a second. Um, Muhammad wrote the Quran in 634 AD. What year? 632, actually. 632, come on, say 632. 632. That is 600 years after Jesus. Would you agree with that? Jesus died in 30 to 34 AD, someplace in that time frame. So 600 years later, Muhammad comes along, and this is important, because my, my, my son was talking with a, with a person at school one day, and like they were just chatting back and forth or whatever. Um, and she's like, I can't follow Christianity because it's the youngest of the religions. And my son was like. <laughs> like 600 years after Jesus, Muhammad starts the Muslim faith. He starts it in 632. Now, here's what he writes about Jesus. Jesus didn't die on the cross. In fact, if you read Surah 4, 157 and 158, you can go look it up on the internet. It actually says that Muhammad, or sorry, not Muhammad, that Judas died in the place of Jesus. How would Muhammad know 600 years later that Judas died on the cross instead of Jesus? But that's what the Quran says. If you ask a Muslim today, they will say that, the, that Jesus did not die on the cross, Judas did. Now what's fascinating about that is Lucian who's a historian at the time of Jesus. He's non-Christian. He writes in 100 AD, Jesus died on the cross. Oh, and the Arabic history of Israel in 100 AD, which I can't pronounce it in Arabic because I can't say those words. Um, like I just, it's like this big long sentence that I, and I can't do it. Um, that's why I just put Arabic history of Israel. <laughs> um, in 100 AD, they write that Jesus died on the cross, as fact. Uh, Josephus, who is the number one historian for the time period of Jesus, and the Roman Empire writes that Jesus died on the cross. Oh, but Muhammad comes along 600 years later and the Quran says, no, he didn't. Judas did. Hmm. Do you want to follow a book without any evidences? See, this book is different than any other book you're ever going to read. Archaeologically, I can prove it time and time and time and time and time again. Oh, but what about the Bible and science? I believe in science. <laughs> You've been baptized. Sorry, not your Libre. <laughs> um, science, let's, talk, let's, talk, let's be science-y for a second. <laughs> let's be a little scientific for a second. Um, the Bible is not at odds with science. How many of you, before, actually take that back down for a second, just because I want to talk about it for just a minute. Just take it back off the screens. Um, how many of you feel like in our culture, science and theologians are fighting all the time. Can I see your hands? Do you know why you feel that way? Because the media loves to stir up controversy again. They want you to watch their news show, so they first go and interview a scientist and say, what do you think about this? And then they run over to a theologian and say, what do you think about that? <gasps> oh, they disagreed, there's a fight. And everybody goes, there must be a fight. Do you realize that a lot of scientists are believers? A lot of scientists believe. They just figure out a way to cause their faith and the scriptures and science to run on parallel tracks. I kind of view the science and the Bible like a railroad track. That the Bible is running on a track, on a line, and science is running on a line, and the Bible's proven science, and science has proven the Bible. They are not at odds with each other, and in fact, I'm gonna talk about a couple things just to prove it to you. The Bible's not at odds with science. The Bible speaks about dinosaurs in two places having existed. Job chapter 40 and Job 41. And I told you earlier, if you remember class, that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was 2800 BC. It was written at the same time period as the, when they built the pyramids. And they're already talking about dinosaurs. So they knew something that we don't know today. What? I don't know. But they knew something. Because he writes about it in two places. Um, the Bible talks about the earth being round in Isaiah 40 a thousand years before anybody believed it was round. 
A thousand years. Huh. The Bible wasn't saying it was flat. I was saying it was round. The Bible speaks of stars being innumerable. Even though the ancients only saw a few. Imagine being an old guy living a long time ago in a cave. You look up at the sky and say, how many stars do you see? Well, how many think there are? Well, I think there are a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand. That's all I can see. Now we get a telescope, we realize there are billions and billions. It is beyond count. Scripture talks over and over again about the stars being innumerable, like grains of the sand of the seashore. Huh. Not at odds. Parallel tracks. Now, I'm going to throw one, out, one more out here just for fun. And, this, and this, is, this is probably the most important one to me. The Bible does not have to be in opposition to evolution. People are always fighting about, about the, just, this is important, so just listen, lean, lean in. People are always fighting about evolution versus six day creation. I'm not gonna have that fight. You say, which was it? I'm like, I don't know, I wasn't there. <laughs> which is it? I don't know, I don't really care about that. I care about you knowing Jesus, that he loves you, that he died for you, that he got a plan for your life. And when Christians get caught up in stupid, and I'm using the word stupid on purpose, a stupid fight over was it six days or six billion years, you're fighting the wrong war. Our goal is not to put up barriers for people's belief. Our goal is to take barriers away so people know that God is for them, that God's got a plan for them, that God can be good to them. Take barriers away, don't put them up. And it's so simple. Like, well, just simple. Like, just, let's just use Genesis chapter one. The Bible's not opposed to evolution. Or, or, or not an opposition to evolution, I'll just give you a thought. The first chapter of the Bible is a Hebrew poem. Now, I'm gonna ask a question. Who bases their, scienti- their science on poetry? Nobody? Okay, good. Did you know that the first chapter of the Bible is a poem? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the, face of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light in the evening and the morning was the first day. First couple verses. Do you know in Hebrew it all rhymes? That way back in the day when it was penned in trying to describe the world coming into being, poetry was written down and God created this and God created that. And kids would have heard the story and it wasn't, check it out, it wasn't how God created, it was that God created. Poetry is about knowing something occurred or something beautiful has happened. And so you write about it from the heart. Sciency is real sciency. See, in this passage, so many theologians interpret this as God created, is that God created the world, not necessarily how God created the world. Maybe he did it in six days. Maybe he did it in six billion years. I don't care. I want you to know Jesus loves you and he designed you and he's got a plan for you. He can help you and be good to you. And if you just trust him, your life will be so much better off than not following him. Come on, is that good news? So why are you fighting the wrong war? Christian, why are you fighting the wrong war? Somebody, somebody last night, I'll just throw this out there, this will be fun. Somebody shouted out to me last night. They're like, well, what about Noah and the ark? Was that flood over the whole world or was it just a local flood? I just said, felt pretty global to Noah. <laughs> Think about it for a second. He don't know how big the earth is. He's like, that's a lot of freaking water. <laughs> I'm getting on the boat. <laughs> Like, we get into arguments about stuff that doesn't matter. Global or local, who cares? God saved Noah, that was awesome. God could save me. That's the point. Don't fight the wrong battles and lose the war. See, I want you to know that, like, these two tracks, faith and science, are not opposed. That you can, you don't have to check your brains at the door in order to be a believer. Now, I'm not telling you how to, that you're gonna approach that subject, but what I am telling you is the Bible is about who? So if you're fighting over six days versus six billion years, you're fighting the wrong battle. You're fighting the wrong battle. Now, I gotta keep moving forward, because I, like, I, like, are you enjoying this? Okay, yeah. so we talked about uh, archeology, span we talked about science a little bit. Got a little sciencey for those of you that are sciencey. Um, I just like saying that word, it's fun. <laughs> I think I made it up, we're gonna clone it. 
Clone is not a word either. <laughs> not in that sense. Okay, anyway. So now we're gonna switch, switch, switch ahead and move to talk about prophecy for a minute. Let's talk about prophecy. Everybody say prophecy. prophecy. Uh, the Bible's prophecy tend to come true. So this book, and by the way, this is true. This book writes, if a prophet speaks a word about the future and it doesn't come to pass, he's not a true prophet, he's a false prophet. This Bible says this. So if the Bible and its truth doesn't come to pass, you should never listen to this. But you know what's fascinating? The Bible's prophecy continually comes to pass. When Bible says this is gonna happen, it eventually does. I'll give you some examples. There's, by the way, we could spend all day on this one too. Um, Simple one, King David prophesies the crucifixion of Jesus a thousand years before it happens and 700 years before crucifixion is even invented. He says Jesus is going to have his hands and feet pierced in, in, in the book of Psalms. And it doesn't, crucifixion doesn't even get invented for 700 more years, how would he know that? Happens exactly like he says. Another one, uh, Isaiah, 500 years before Christ lives, he writes about the beatings of Jesus, the no response of Christ, the pierced hands and feet before crucifixion is invented again, and his burial in a rich man's tomb, all 500 years before Jesus even exists. Happens exactly as he writes it. Now I'm gonna take it further. There's this guy named Ezekiel, who's a really weird dude, he writes a lot of prophecy. Um, but one of his prophecies is about a city called Tyre. Come on, say Tyre. And now I'm gonna nerd out on you. Um, Tyre, uh, he, he says about Tyre, he says Tyre is gonna get totally destroyed. It's gonna get jacked. And the people of Tyre and the people who read the Bible were like, that's dumb, man, it's not gonna get wrecked. Because it's like the most secure city on earth. Like Tyre sits a mile off the coast of the Mediterranean. So every time somebody attacks the shoreline, the, Tyre, the people of Tyre would just run out to their little, their little haven on the island. They'd, they'd close up all their gates and be like, ha ha, we're a mile off the shore, you can't get us. And no matter what anybody tried, they could never conquer Tyre. It went on for generation after generation after generation. Ezekiel writes, someday, somebody gonna figure out how to destroy that city and they're gonna level it. And somebody does, his name is Alexander the Great. Shows up in the 300s, he's conquering the known world. He shows up along the coastline that all the people of Tyre run out to those little city. They're like, ha ha, you can't get to us. And Alex goes, yes I can. He spends a year of his life having his army built a mile-long highway out into the ocean. You can still see the causeway from space today. And then they level Tyre and destroy all its inhabitants exactly as Ezekiel writes it. You can see the picture from space. This highway he builds to ruin the city. And then this last one, Jesus prophesies in uh, Matthew 13, verse two. By the way, like there's, there's 27 prophecies that get fulfilled in one day on the life of Christ. But this one, Jesus prophesies in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse two, not one stone will be left upon another on the temple mount. Now, I'm gonna back up and kind of explain it to you. So in the, at the time period of Jesus, the most magnificent building in Israel was the temple. I mean, it was gorgeous. I mean, it was freaking awesome. They were like, whoa, this thing's great. He walks into the temple and goes, see all this? It's gonna get ruined and destroyed. They're not even gonna leave one rock left on another. And the people of the day, if you read the passage, they laugh at him. They're like, that's dumb. That's never gonna happen. This place is, I mean, it's, it's legit, man. There's no way this is going away. 40 years later, the Jews piss off the Romans. Titus raises a massive Roman army, decimates Israel, surrounds Jerusalem. Josephus writes, I told you earlier, he's one of the greatest historians of all time. Josephus writes that Titus crucified 550 Jews, men, women, and children, per day on crosses for five months outside the city walls. The people in, inside the city are just desperate. They know they're gonna die. They're not leaving anybody alive. I mean, they're killing everybody. They can hear people screaming and the murders going on day and night for five solid months. They're freaking out. They're like, we gotta, we gotta hide all of our valuables. We don't want the Romans to get it because we know we're probably not gonna make it, but we gotta hide our valuables. So they hide stuff in the temple. They take all the gold and all the precious stuff and they stick it in the temple. Um, and Titus gets tired. He gets tired of waiting around to destroy the last inhabitants of Jerusalem. So he brings in catapults called an onager. Um, it's the, uh, this is because I love history. It means wild ass in Italian. Um, they lob 70 pound boulders, these, this onager does. Dipped in tar, lit on fire over the city walls. They could shoot them for a half a mile. These are the precursors to bombs. 
and they start bombing the city of Jerusalem with these giant 70 pound boulders all lit on fire. Everything goes up in fire. It's, the whole place is burning. Eventually the temple gets hit so many times that the interior of the temple catches on fire. All of the gold in the temple melts. It goes down in the floor of the temple. Every little crack on the temple floor is full of little pieces of gold. Finally, Titus conquers the city, slaughters everybody, rushes to get the gold out of the temple, realizes it's all melted. Only way to get to it is to pull every stone off the temple. And so he pulls every rock out to get at the loot. Exactly as Jesus predicted 40 years earlier. See, what I want you to understand is that this book is special. When it prophesies something, boom, it comes to pass. I, by the way, in being in Israel, the rocks that he threw off the Temple Mount are still laying there today. From when he threw them off in 70 AD, I've stood next to the piles of rocks that he's had thrown off the Temple Mount. This book is proven by archaeology, by prophecy, by history. Now, I'm going to say something that might sound a little bit weird, but I'm not a Christian for any of that. That stuff didn't convince me to be a Christian. I, I like that stuff, it's interesting. But I'm not a Christian because of that. You know why I'm a Christian? Or you know why I believe, let me just say it differently. Do you know why I believe the Bible? Just because Jesus did. In fact, I would say it like this. Jesus believed the Bible was from God, so I do. This is important. How many of you would say Jesus was probably one of the best lived lives ever? Be honest. You don't have to be a believer, but you believe, come on, put your hands up if you think Jesus lived a great life. Most people would agree with that. Like, Jesus lived a great life. He was a good guy. He was a wise guy. Do you realize that all of Christ's foundation was this? Where did he get his wisdom? Oh, from this. What did he believe in? This. What did he follow? This. So when somebody says, I don't believe the Bible, you're saying you're smarter than Jesus. One of the wisest men to ever live. I'm not so arrogant to say that. I'm like, man, Jesus is way smarter than me, man. If he believed it, like, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that, like, you know what? I'm better off if I just buy it. People don't recognize the fact when you say, I don't believe it, you're saying, I'm really smarter than Jesus. I'm probably wiser than him. I'll probably live a better life. Really, you, you try it. See how well it goes for you. <laughs> See, Christ's entire foundation, his entire belief system, everything was built around this book. The reason why we got his wisdom came out of this book. He is the pinnacle of what this book teaches and here's what he says in Matthew 5, 18. He says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything, come on, say everything, everything. is accomplished. He believes it from beginning to end. In fact, Jesus believed that Adam and Eve existed. Matthew 19, 4, he talks about Adam and Eve. He believed Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days, uh, Matthew 12. He believes Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Uh, he believed Abraham was a real person, that David was a real person, that Noah and a great flood occurred. He believed all this stuff. And I'm not so arrogant as to say, no, you know what, I, I, know, more, I know more than Jesus. Yeah. So when somebody goes down that road, I wanna say, man, I hope that works out for you because I've never seen anybody live a good life as Jesus. I've never seen anybody be more forgiving or more grace-filled or more kind or more loving or more good. And he got it all from this. So I'm a Jesus follower and I follow the book because Jesus followed the book. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'll throw one more last thought out here and this is, this is how I'm gonna wrap it up. And that's this. This is my last thought. The reason why I'm a believer at the end of the day like if you really wanna get technical about it, why do I believe the Bible? Because it makes me a better person. Do I get it all? Come on, do I get it all? <laughs> no, is there lots of stuff that makes me scratch my head? Yes. Is there lots of stuff that I'm like, I don't really get why that's there, that's okay. I'm flipping around to Jesus, where was that? <laughs> like I, I'm the same way as you, like, they're, they're, like I, I don't get all of it, I don't understand it all, but here's what I know. When I trust it and read it, my life is better off. I can forgive you even if you're a jerk to me. It gives me the ability. When I read the scriptures, I'm like, oh, I can forgive you. When I'm discouraged, my anxiety flees when I read the scriptures. When I'm struggling with depression, it is, it is this book that's helped me conquer depression. So many people who were addicts have become free from addiction as they read this book. 
Marriages get restored as people just try to learn the word of God. People make really wise choices and better decisions just by reading the book. Here's, here's what I want you to know. I don't believe it because I understand it all. I believe it because it helps me. It helps me. My marriage is better, my kids are better off. I'm a better dad. I'm kinder to people. I'm more loving. You say, where did all that come from? I'm not perfect, I haven't got it all figured out, but every little bit of positive I got came from this. And so I value it and I love it and it's worth something to me. I'm challenging those of you online, those of you in this room, maybe you're a little skeptical about the scriptures. It's okay to be skeptical. Do you realize that asking questions is the number one way to build your faith? It's how faith gets built, you ask questions. All I'm hoping happened today was, you're a little less skeptical than when you came in the door. And maybe you didn't buy it all and like, okay, but maybe it's a little bit okay. Like there's some good stuff. Maybe like, okay, good. If I moved you even an inch, I'm doing my job. At the end of the day, here's the, here's the truth. What you think about the Bible will determine what you get from the Bible. Hear that online too. If you think the Bible is just nothing, it doesn't count, you'll always believe that no matter what because it doesn't count, it's nothing, it's, it's worthless. But if at some point you're open to the thought process, maybe it could be good for me. Maybe there could be some good stuff here. Maybe it could help me immediately. You'll get some good stuff out of it. Because what you think about, you bring about. Where the mind goes, the man follows. What you believe about the scriptures determines whether you ever get anything out. You could get something great. It could help you, it could guide you, it could be so good to you if you just believed it could. So maybe that could be your choice today. The Bible's good and it could help me. It'll start. Today could be a good day. Now, I'm gonna end with this. How many of you um, enjoyed this conversation, Nick? Put your hands up. So, most every hand went up in the room. Do you know what I did today? I taught one hour class from the Crossing College. That's what this was. If you're ever like, like I really wanna know my faith, that's why the Crossing College exists. I just taught you one hour of the Crossing College. So here's what I would, challenge you to do. If you love this, you're like, man, like I, I want to know my faith. I want to understand how it works and I want to dig deeper to this. I'm going to challenge you to come when the Susan service is over, I will be on the front of the stage and I want to talk to you about Crossing College for five minutes. I want to give you some info about the, about the college, about what it could mean for you. Not about like how you could become a pastor, but literally there's a diploma in biblical studies that could just help you understand the Bible. So you can know the word of God and what it's about and where it came from. And you're gonna get this in a much greater depth than I could ever give you in a weekend service. Your faith is gonna get grounded. I'm gonna challenge you if you're even the least bit interested, stay after service. Let me talk to you for five minutes about how maybe going across in college this coming fall could be helpful. Let me pray for you, Jesus. I'm thankful and grateful for how you work in our lives. I'm thankful, I'm thankful for the word of God that we are not a, a left alone, but you've given us a good book, a love letter to help us make good decisions. You're a good dad with a good heart, and you've got good plans. So God, we, we value the scriptures. Teach us more of it, help us understand more to our depth, but not because we wanna know stuff, but because we wanna know you, Jesus. Teach us to know you, and then transform our lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit, amen.